offensive. I have no tolerance for it. I've heard it. Some of the stuff is troubling. Uh, Westbrook does kind of appear to be a very impulsive player and a personality. So he comes in that arena. He's a pretty relentless, impulsive guy. What do you make of what happened last night? Like when you watch that, what's the first thing that lands for you, Greg? The first thing that lands for me is every player is going to handle situations differently. Um, and what, what we have to understand is there is kind of a threshold that players have. I don't care who you are to tolerating heckling and harassment. Um, but then there's there's that level or that that line that you draw that you don't expect a fan or a heckler to cross. And when they do, it gains your attention. You then turn to them and you give them what you either feel or an, a, a, a motion that lets them know, stop it, cut that out. And I think that's what happened to Russell Westbrook. It happens across sport. It's like we're often the target of angry words, and we have to endure these insults and just walk away or go back to our field of play and just continue to go as though nothing ever happened. And that's just not the reality. Sometimes there are things that are said that just cross the line. If we were in uh, the world of, of, of a career space uh, within a, a building, it would be called harassment. Yeah. You would have to suffer some penalty. If you're in public uh, academic fields or settings, it's bullying. Like So it, this is often just uh, uh, allowed in sports, which is unfortunate, but players understand that this is going to happen. You're going to get heckled. But when you cross the line and you start to say things that are become corrosive, that – that there's no there's no need for any of that shift to the NFL Antonio Brown's a great player and John Gruden and Derek Carr are smart good quality offensive guys here's my concern is that when you do bring in an often vocal demanding star receiver the offense becomes like a home run hitter in baseball you become a little dependent on it would you be concerned that the Raiders now are going to become very a b kind of centric and that what happens sometimes when baseball teams become reliant on the home run hitter you become reliant on the star receiver you get to the playoffs and teams take it away Tyreek Hill's taken away by New England and Patrick Mahomes isn't the same quarterback how do you think AB will fit in Oakland we know he's going to be productive do you think it just all works uh, so I'm 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 kind of on on your side with this. I, I know he's going to be productive. That's what he's always been able to do. Obviously in Pittsburgh, as long as he has a guy that can give him the ball, and I believe Derek Carr can get him the ball. I just don't know how frequently he'll be able to get him the ball. Um, and why I say that is because when you part ways with a young talent like Amari Cooper, who we saw and we see who can create and generate separation for a young quarterback who is younger, who has the speed, who has the skill set. And then you bring in on who does not vocally um, kind of divide a locker room. Uh, then you bring on a guy like Antonio Brown, who has all those same abilities, but he's going to be more vocal because his expectations are a little higher. His standard of, of, production is a, it's a little higher yeah. and he's going to demand even more out of your quarterback. My concern is how does Derek Carr respond with that? Is a Antonio Brown going to help Derek Carr? I truly believe so. But is Derek Carr going to be able to step up to the plate and take on what comes with having a really, really high profile, great receiver in Antonio Brown? You know, it, it's funny. You know, we were talking about the Odell Beckham situation. Uh, I actually talked to him recently, and I like him. And I and I I get where he's coming from. Um, I think he he once an injury happens to a great player, reality sets in, urgency sets in. Like, hey man, I just suffered a major injury here. I got to make some hay. I got to make some catches. And I think Odell's feeling a little bit of that pressure, like. You know, if I have another major injury, a lot of people are not going to see me as the same player. Do you think the Giants, would you move him if you could get the pieces? Because I don't think the Giants thing works for him personally. I don't think Eli can get him the ball enough. What do you think happens with Odell? Um, ultimately, I would like to see him stay in New York. Uh, and they do something at the quarterback position that will uh, comp uh, complement his skill set. Uh, will that happen? Only time will tell. So let's go to the 49ers situation. It is a very intriguing 
um, move for Odell as well as the San Francisco 49ers. Why? Because you have your quarterback in place in Jimmy Garoppolo, obviously coming off an injury. Odell Beckham can relate to that, having suffered an injury uh, the previous, not last year, but the year before. And so they have a different mentality, as you alluded to, coming off an injury, a different um, approach to the game. Uh, it's, it's not so much a pressure it's a level of respect that this isn't forever. This can be taken away. And I think when you bring in a guy like Odell Beckham and you have a Jared McKinnon who has suffered an injury as well, they all have something to prove. And so if you put that together along with what you already currently have in the Kittles at tight end, who is really a hybrid tight end that really can uh, game break at any moment offensively, it's, a com it's an explosion, an explosive offense that, I think will be exciting and this and the 49ers understand that with Shanahan at the helm it, it could be special and I think it would work well for Odell Beckham. Finally, uh free agency is interesting. So, you're in a locker room and maybe you're not making as much as you think, then all of a sudden the team like the Jets brings in like four new guys and they're four of the <laughs> highest guys, highest paid guys. And you know, we all just think everybody's happy, but you know, you know, this is players have short careers. They keep track of the money, not just their production. Have you ever been in a locker room where free agency and bringing a guy in didn't rub the locker room the right way? Of course. Of course. It happens more frequently than what I think it. we talk about it. Um, everyone in the locker room is going to question. Players understand. They, they know players. They know what is uh, worth the money. And they know what they feel to be not worth the money. And so when you bring or acquire a player who was in a system and they were productive in that system, it's going to be questioned whether or not they can be productive outside of that system. But I will, I will caution you at this. Players make systems work. And systems make and showcase players in a better light. And so when you move guys from New England and you take them, uh, Trey Flowers and the Trent Brown and uh, Nate Solder, and you put them in a, a different dynamic, now they're playing for contract. They're not so much, yes, do they want to win, but they're playing for financial gain. When you're in New England, you're not only playing for financial gain, but you're playing with the, the standard and the bar being set as we win and we win championships. And so there's a different level of accountability, and I think you get more, so to speak, uh, you wring out more in that sponge when you have a system and an organization like the New England Patriots. Uh, but I think you have to pay these guys. You have to take that risk. You have to take that chance because, again, as I alluded to, players make systems work, but systems make players better. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at all. I, I don't know if I'd ever do business with New England. The last two years, it's interesting. The teams that have done business with New England players have often been desperate teams. Oakland, Detroit, Miami, Tennessee, twice in the Giants. Teams that are either in a spot where they could go over the cliff or they've gone over the cliff. So, you know, you can see the people that are trying to get Patriot players and make it work. They're often teams that are a little desperate. And I kind of felt like that with Detroit yesterday. And I kind of feel like Tennessee may be doing the same thing. So, Greg Jennings, good talking to you. Thanks for stopping by the show today. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me, as always. You know, it, it's funny about that. If Warren Buffett sold a stock, you'd be like, I may not buy the stock. If Bill Belichick sells a player, generally you'd be like, yeah, it's time to move off the player. But Wall Street is run by fear and greed. And the NFL is run by fear and desperation. And start looking at all the players New England lets go of and where do they go? They don't go to the great teams very rarely. I mean, you know, Chris Long went to the Eagles. But generally it's a lot of Jets, Darrell Revis, and Giants, and Tennessee, and Oakland, and Detroit. And well, I'm not saying I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in on a player that's leaving New England, but I wouldn't pay him an incredible amount of money. Well, that's what they did yesterday, the I, Raiders. Right. And the, like, based off of the track record that you just gave, there's nothing wrong with, with bringing that player onto your team, but investing in that player is a different, like different I, story. Trey Flowers is a good player, but he's not a good player at that number, and Trent Brown's a nice talent, 
but he's not, he's not at that number. This is a salary cap league. And I think, you know, you watch New England and everybody wants a piece of New England, but it's like Golden State Warriors right now. I mean, everybody's like, oh, everything works. And, and Clay Thompson and Steph and, and Kevin Iran, uh, somebody's going to overpay for Draymond Green. And it's like that system makes Draymond more than Draymond makes that system. And, you know, proximity to genius isn't genius. We've seen that with <laughs> Belichick's assistant coaches. And we're going to find out this year with all the McVay hires. Yeah, I, uh, Detroit, I think, overspent for Trey Flowers. Oakland overspent for Trent Brown. If Warren Buffett sells a stock, you may want to move off the stock. Belichick moves off a player. He's generally right. Coming up next, I talked to a source in the last 24 hours that said, of course the Lakers are a mess. Look who's leading them. I'll explain that coming up. What you don't want when you buy a car and the warranty runs out is to get snagged for a $600 bill or worse. You want protection. You want an extended vehicle warranty. That's where CarShield comes in. First of all, they make the process of fixing your car for a covered repair really easy. Uh, you pick the mechanic.